This is Christine Sanchez and Michaela Williamson. It is June 15th, 2022, and we are sitting here with Dr. Kathleen Deegan in St. Augustine, Florida. Dr. Deegan, may I ask you to say and spell your full name? It's Kathleen Deegan, uh, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, D-E-A-G-A-N. Thank you, Dr. Deegan. You're welcome. All right. So let's start off with when and where were you born? I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia in uh, 1948, and, uh, but I only lived there for a month. My dad was in the Navy and got transferred right away. Uh, can you tell me about your childhood? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, as, well, I was in a Navy family, and in those days, uh, families went with uh, the the person who was in the in the in the service, whether it was the mother or the father, but um, we moved every two years till I started college. So I got to go to twelve schools before college, and whenever it was possible, a Catholic school. But my dad was a uh, typhoon meteorologist, and so we only lived in places that had tropical storms, and uh, so we ended up living in. Taiwan and England and Japan and Florida uh, and in New Jersey. Um, what was it like growing up in a changing environment? Well, it was a really changing environment every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at, you know, when you're a kid, you you only know what you know. And so you're, you get used to it. You learn to uh, adjust yourself to fit the new circumstances and um, it, it was all, never the same but it was um, you know some places it was just really easy and you fit in other places could have sort of never felt like you were part of being there but overall it was looking back on it it's great it gives you good uh, survival skills uh, did you resonate with like any specific place or neighborhood while you were moving uh, I really loved, we, I went to a couple of my high school years, soft, well, actually three of them in Guam, and I really enjoyed Guam. Guam was a great place for uh, kids. We, uh, I went to the Academy of Our Lady of Guam, and um, it was a small town and uh, the, the capital, Aganya, but it was, uh, it was kind of idyllic, really, small, you were surrendered on, by other Navy kids, but also the kids in the community all became friends. So I got to know a lot of people from Guam, learned a little bit of Chamorro, and um, I, I, when I think back, that's that's the, uh, the one that I, I think most fondly of, I think. Although I loved England and other places. Um, what was your early education like under those circumstances? Very spotty. <laughs> Because I started school in England, they have a much more advanced um, early education than in the United States. So I skipped a grade um, when I came back. But then later, I've forgotten which one, I, I stayed in the same grade because of changes in school. So it was pretty spotty. And um, in the formative years in high school were at the Academy of Our Lady of Guam, which was... Uh, a very small conservative school, really want, uh, taught young women to train as you were going to be a nun or a mother. And uh, so I never did take any kind of science or math courses past algebra. And uh, so in that way, it was uh, not very rigorous, but it was very diverse uh, and uh, interesting. So I had to start college on probation because I hadn't had all these basic courses. Um, did you have a favorite subject in school? I think probably English and reading and writing. I, I think that would have been my favorite subject. Uh, what were your career goals when you were younger? You know, I didn't really have any. Uh, it. it and becoming an archaeologist was almost an accident for me. I, I didn't have career goals because I guess I didn't know enough about 
what was out there. And at that time, you know, in 1965, when I graduated from high school, uh, there just weren't that many options for girls or women. And so the idea was that I was supposed to get a job where I could um, work, but be home in the summer because the kids would be home. And you know, there was that, that whole dynamic then. So I majored in journalism, which was really fun. But, and then I majored in sociology because I thought I could get a job. And then education. And I didn't really like any of them very much. But I kept sneaking in archaeology courses from Dr. Fairbanks. And, and by the time I was ready to graduate, they said, you either have to major in anthropology or you're spending another semester or two semesters here to get another major. So I said, oh, sign me up. <laughs> and uh, so then I continued majoring in anthropology and graduated. So I think it really, you um, if you find something that just resonates with you in that way that you just keep your guilty pleasure even, uh, go for it because you'll love it. And if you love it, you'll be good at it. And if you're good at it, you'll um, you'll do well, so. Um, where did you go to college? University of Florida mm -hmm. for my uh, BA and my PhD. I didn't get a master's. I went away in the interim for a year or two in California. I was going to start in, at UC Davis, but it was 1970, and <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> I, ne I never did. <laughs> um, when and where was your first job? Like archaeology job or other real job? Um, an archaeology job. Because I was first a lifeguard for mm. a while. But my first archaeology job was, <laughs> was with the Girl Scouts um, in, in Ocala in, near Gainesville. And they, one of their camps was a uh, archaeology camp. And so I was a grad student then and went and, and worked with them to um, excavate this, this little sand mound. We didn't find much. But it was, uh, it was my first you know, real job. I wrote a report. It was really, we didn't find anything. But I remember Dr. Fairbanks saying, you really squeezed a lot out of that one, didn't you? I was, I was so excited to be writing my first professional report. But <laughs> a lot of words that said pretty much nothing. Um, what organizations are you currently involved, if any? Uh, well, I still belong to um, Society for American Archaeology and Historical Archaeology and Ethnohistory, and I'm a little more active in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And locally, the St. Augustine Historical Society and Flagler College and the University of Florida's, uh, excuse me, I think we have a visitor. Hi, man. Is there anyone sitting there? She's in her office. She's. They sit it downstairs up here. Uh, she only opened the room for us. We haven't seen her since. We don't know where she is. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Shut the door. Well, I, I didn't mean. I didn't want to, you know, interrupt. Like it's he okay. was Gesturing, and mm -hmm. I thought maybe something was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I've been playing yeah, with this. This, this whole bit will be edited out now. So Good. well, I know these. Yay! Okay. Okay. Where were we? Uh, did you finish listing the oh. organizations you're in currently, or? Um, uh, there, there are a lot of them. Uh, I'm retired, but you know, of course, still interested, and I want to get the journals and go to meetings and, and those things. So, mm -hmm. but, but locally, uh, Flagler College and um, the Historical Society and the St. Augustine Archaeological Association, and, and I'm on the board for the University of Florida Historic St. Augustine program, which is a great one.
Um, what made you come to St. Augustine? It's interesting. Um, I was really just in the early 70s, gender and I was interested in gender and identity. And um, I, I hadn't, there wasn't much out there about women in our, you know, archaeological work that focused on what women did or, or gender did. And my major professor had been working in St. Augustine before at a site that was occupied by a, a native woman, a, a Wali woman, married to a Spanish soldier. And uh, he was excavating it because it was after that, th there was a Menorcan occupation, a, a local St. Augustine group. Um, but I was interested in the earlier ones. So we were able to set it up. I got an NSF dissertation grant to look at that part. And I was just curious about how women might have been, native women might have been culture brokers between uh, European and, and indigenous society. And so that, that was how I first came to St. Augustine because it really was a, a, a ideal site and it was available and had been tested already uh, to, to look at that, that problem. When did you first hear about Fort Mose? When I was a graduate student, and in fact, I came out when I was in our field school, I think it must have been 1971 or 70. Uh, my, I keep mentioning Dr. Fairbanks. He was a really big influence on me and, and what I've done, but he was one of the first people to be interested in plantation archaeology and the archaeology of enslavement and He'd worked at Kingsley, <clears throat> but he was really, he was interested in Fort Mose. He you know, had read about it. So one, we were in field school in near Gainesville, <clears throat> and we came to St. Augustine for a week uh, and looked, he wanted to test the site that, that everyone thought had been Fort Mose. And so we were out there for you know, a week doing some preliminary tests and augering and so that's how I first heard about it, and was, you know, of course then, like, completely fascinating, because no one really knew about it. In your experience, do people recognize... <laughs> Are you Mr. Silver? I have a friend here this morning to do a podcast or an interview with some young people about voting. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't seen anybody. Have they all had you been back up? No. Not since she let us in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In your experience, do people... In your experience, do people recognize Fort Mose today? Well, more people do than, than used to, but I'm still amazed at, at how many people don't. Not so much here in San Augustine or Florida, but um, like journalists will discover Fort Mose and want to you know, do a story to tell people about Fort Mose. And I'm always amazed because there's been just a lot of writing and work and exhibits and publicity. And it, it just, uh, maybe more people do than I think. But, you know, when we first did the, um, the first Fort Mose exhibit that was a traveling exhibit, it, it traveled, it kept, we had to keep it on the road for like seven years, which is really unusual because there was a lot of demand for it in museums. And um, I, I, Darcy McMahon, who is our uh, exhibit guru, uh, in charge of that at, at uh, the Florida Museum, estimated, I think, that like some 7 million people visited it. So it, it always still surprises me when someone doesn't know. But that has changed a lot. 
What, in your opinion, was the public perception of Fort Mose when you were doing your excavations? That's interesting because people here at that time didn't really know about it. I had given some talks, but it's usually to people who were already committed to history and archaeology. The, the general public really wasn't that involved, but there was some pushback uh, in, in the community about having Fort Mose here and, and saying that it was there and excavating it with public money. Uh, there was a, some discussion that this was creating false history to get money from the state. And um, we were, Jane and I and, and Representative Clark were like maligned one, a few times. It wasn't huge, but there was some resistance to having having it be here. They didn't think that was a uh, real or so that I'll have to dig out some of those news articles for you to put with your archive. But but uh, but after that, though, I think it became a real cause celebre in the community because uh, it was the very first organization I, I ever recalled that had that brought people from the black community and white community together and in the Fort Mose Historical Society, which is for St. Augustine. I mean, it was admittedly has a really troubled racial history. And it had only been, well, when we were first starting there, 10 or 15 years since the, the civil rights material, and there were still people very, there still are people, you know, very resistant to to that, so uh, it's changed a lot. But at the very beginning, there there was some pushback, but it be, it was overcome by the community. Can you describe any archaeological challenges that you faced when working at Fort Mose? Well, one that you all know very well: getting to the site. <laughs> at that time, it was owned; it was in private ownership. Um, so we would walk out, not realizing the damage that was doing, but it, just the logistics of, of working at that site because it's, it's surrounded by submerged land. Um, and that was a, a real challenge. And the, the field school students were great. They would wade out. Uh, and it was winter when we were, I remember one of them was in the January to um, March semester. And uh, so it could be cold out there. But uh, there was that, and just the, the, those kinds of difficulties. But also the, um, the Mose occupation was really brief. And there had been other occupations, particularly later ones, uh, Spanish and Menorcan. And we, at that time, we thought probably an earlier one. Uh, we knew that there was a mission in the area, and probably a Native American. It was you know, a good site for all kinds of reasons. So isolating um, the Mose occupation in a thick shell midden, is, as you know very well, is a real challenge and very slow going. And um, especially in shell, often it's very difficult to see horizons. But so that, that was, it made it a very slow moving project. Um, the other challenge was we really felt that we had to prove that it was Fort Mose because of the challenges to the project. We had to um, look for architectural uh, features. We had to demonstrate that this, this was the place. And so um, we, that challenge, sort of a social challenge, uh, made us not get as much of the life of the people, that, which is what we were most interested in. But, and then getting artifacts and shells, shell samples and dirt samples out was was hard too. Just we thought we could wheelbarrow, but we always ended up carrying wheelbarrows filled with with materials. So uh, it, it's a challenging site uh, in in a number of different ways. Can you describe your involvement, if any, in the Fort Mose Historical Society? 
Uh, well, I'm a charter member uh, and have been a member, I've given talks and gone to the meetings and um, really enjoyed, um, enjoyed that. What role, if any, did you have in the creation of the current Fort Mose Museum? Uh, well, it, I was on the uh, board of advisors um, just because of, we had done the work and done, done another exhibit and and uh, worked with the Park Service and Wilderness Graphics was a company in Tallahassee that, that did the exhibit itself and we worked with them. And then all of the materials, the artifact materials, were at the Florida Museum that I was curating then when, and so it was a lot of involvement. How has your work at Fort Mose impacted other areas of your life and research? I think Fort Mose made me much more aware of the importance a site can have to a community. Uh, and uh, the, you know, I, I don't think our finds archaeologically were uh, as exciting as, as, as what I, I was hoping for originally of, of uncovering life, the life and the adjustment of these people who had been in Africa and been in, in Carolinas and then come here in a new, yet new uh, kind of political environment. Uh, that's what we were wanting to know about, how they adjusted and lived and accommodated. But, uh, and we did some of that, but finding you know, the fort, I think, just establishing that it was in fact real and it was there and that we could tell people about it. And uh, that was the important thing. And, you know, I think I had always focused only on the data, you know, and the problem. And because you write a grant proposal and you have a, a you know, a, a goal, a problem that, and you focus on that. But Port Mose was really different. It really um, may, woke me up to um, how critical just knowing a place is there is. And it's really important, it's really, a, it's about the place and, and knowing that it was the place. And then that led to, I've often said, the best thing that came out of the archeology span at Fort Mose was the history. Um, Jane's work, she was a student then, and we, um, she, from the funds, supported her in Spain to look for um, any information, you know, we always used to hear when I was just coming up in historical archaeology that these are the people without history, that there's really no, we have to rely on archaeology to tell their story because there's no written record. Well, there is in a lot of cases, and people just haven't really looked for it. And Jane specifically did and found you know, really detailed information, just way more than we imagined. And so uh, that, that's another thing that Mose has made me much more, or made me much more um, aware of the need to incorporate at the very beginning all of these disciplines. Uh, so it, it has, I think, impacted my work. Since then, I've been pretty cognizant of, of the community that the site is in, and um, if it, you know, does it, is it important to people? Do they see it as part of their their own heritage or not? And if they do, then uh, let's shape this in a different way. What, in your opinion, is the importance of Fort Mose and its story today? Where to begin? <laughs> well, I think the, the importance is that it shows a, a, the diversity of the African-American historical experience. It was not one monolithic story of plantation slavery. And, and the, um, the agency of people who were enslaved has always, you know, before archeologists, I think, got involved, it's been really downplayed. But the, the, the planning and the strategy and the hardships that it must have taken to get here and just be, be determined to do that, I think, is a, a tremendous story. And uh, it's one that um, a lot of communities really take pride in because they haven't been 
given or revealed or seen a lot of stories that involve that kind of agency. And, um, and I think, I think, I hope it enters more broadly <clears throat> into the national con consciousness and national story. A lot of people have tried, so I... So, um, what's something you wish people knew about Fort Mose if it like got to the national conscience? I wish they just knew the story, the, the story of Fort Mose, and that we know where it is, that we know who these people were, what they went through. Um, they can, some of them can, it's just an amazing story. You know, and it, I think it's a story that has resonated tremendously with media people. And there have been several um, efforts to do films. I mean, a major film from Hollywood, and people have been interested, but it has never actually come to pass. But the story does capture, I mean, children's books, authors always want to, to write um, about Fort Mose, and uh, so th that story grabs people and, and resonates. I, I really do wish there would be, you know, a film with you know, Denzel or, <laughs> and you know, one of our stars, and, and that would it's, that would do it. I think. What are your hopes for Fort Mose as it gains more recognition? I just hope that it does gain recognition, that people come visit it, that it's in school textbooks, and that uh, people know that this is a part of our, our early colonial history. And there's a lot more to Fort Mose, too, than just the fort. It's the whole um, political dynamics, international rivalries and warfare and and you know it has a lot to do with how who speaks what language where and how things turned out for the, you know the divisions in the United States and so that's that's a bigger story too but uh, that, that I, I hope that that becomes part of it a little more consciously as well if you were to continue work at Fort Mose, what research questions would you like to work on? Well, I would work on just what um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Davidson and and uh, Dr. Irola. Irola. <laughs> I'm sorry, cut that out. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Lee and Dr. Davidson and Dr. Irola are working on, which is to learn more about um, life and people there. Uh, I think it would be also interesting to try, we tried, is to locate more of the community outside the fort itself, although I have my doubts about whether that's even possible. Um, but I think both of those things, understanding the wider Mosaic community and also the people, and um, that's what we had wanted to do originally and weren't able to, and so I'm really glad that, that you all are doing that. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us that we have not covered yet today? Um, I think that, I don't know whether, I think it's important to get it on oral history. The, the reason we couldn't look at the people any more than we could, and it, it was political, and we had gotten a, a large grant to work there for several years, and the landowner, um, it was willing to sell this, this. He wanted to sell the property, and he owned a lot of property around this, this the uh, the fort itself. And he also was did not wasn't particularly keen on the story of Fort Mose. He uh, he kept wanting us to tell the Patriot War, the War of eighteen twelve story. But and there was an important battle and camp there during the, the Patriot War, and. Uh, so he was not very um, happy <laughs> about the, the Mose emphasis. And uh, the, the, he didn't get along very well either with the, some of the black members of the Florida legislature who were supporting the project. And 
there became a, a issue of, of of this land, and he wanted he. He wanted to sell it, and he had a certain amount of money, and the state sent out appraisers and did all the, that kind of due diligence, and it wasn't the same amount, and so there became a real uh, kind of battle. And, um, and so we were told to leave in the middle of our second full season, and, um, and so we did, and, uh, and that's really, you know, it was truncated for polit political reasons more than anything, and um, it just never started back. But with the funds that were left over, we were able to um, do the ex traveling exhibit, which which was good, and um, and there was a lot of conflict over the artifacts. Uh, the, the, we were sued to, to get the artifacts back to the owner. But fortunately, um, there had been agreements made at the time we were setting it up that the Florida Museum would curate them. So they did take back some of the artifacts that were like the religious medallion that's so famous and some models. And you know, But other than that, it, it was resolved. So, But I think... I mean, you can't separate Mose from the, the kind of political climate. And today, people are really excited and happy, and uh, and so that's I think wonderful. Do you feel that the underwater archaeology that's currently going on kind of serves as a remedy for the lost time of the situation you just described? Well, it partly does. Uh, it depends on how. Um, well, the the finds <clears throat> can be connected to Fort Mose. Excuse me, <clears throat> but it's it's certainly going to enhance what uh, what we know about the material world of of the people who lived there, and that'll be important. <clears throat> and I think it's a just you know, it's a very remarkable um, kind of partnership there that the terrestrial and uh, land archaeology and the fact that you're doing it at the same time. The few projects I've seen before that have done that have been isolated. You know, the underwater people will do their work and then the terrestrial people will do their work and it's not always at the same time. But I just, from my brief visit to the site, it was, it was a real interplay between the two groups all the time and what you're finding, which is terrific. I hope that and <clears throat> continuing work at Mose will will fill in the gaps that we, we couldn't. Well, Dr. Deacon, I would like to say thank you once again oh. for speaking with us this morning. Oh. Um, we really appreciate your time and your insight and your willingness to let us record <clears throat> you and save this for future generations that will be helping to tell the Fort Mose story. Well, it's a pleasure, and I thank you for what you're doing to make that happen. Yes, sir.